Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church. Healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Ashley, and I am so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, pen, and paper, your phone, however you want to take notes, and get ready for today's message. We are going to start out with a game, so everybody needs to get their phones out. We're playing something called a Kahoot. Go ahead, get out your cell phones. If you need Wi-Fi, connect to Family Church Open Wi-Fi. And we have this code on the screen, 300-280. That is on Kahoot.it. This is going to be part of our Emojins sermon. Here we go. What does this emoji mean? And go ahead and answer on your phone. Does it mean sad, meh? Confused or angry? What does it mean? If you're online, go ahead, put it in the comment section. What does this emoji mean? <laughs> this emoji means sad. Give it up for yourself if you got it right. We have Mighty Deer and Nimble Goose tied for first place. Let's go on to the next question. Question number two, what does this emoji mean? Does it mean praise the Lord, amen, hallelujah, or high five? Your answer will change based upon how long you've been in church. I want to add that in. Which one does it mean? All right, here we go. The answer is, it means high five. It should mean praise the Lord. No, it means high five. Amazon Boa into first place, followed by Joyful Owl. On to the next one. Question three. What does this emoji mean? Does it mean praying for you? Let's fight. Please and thank you, or I have no idea. All my church people are like, mm, I know this one. Put it right on Facebook. What does this emoji mean? The answer is please and thank you. It does not mean praying for you. <laughs> On to the next one. We got a cheerful dog, hallelujah, in first place. On to the next one. Question four. What does this emoji mean? Is it, is it a sassy female, help desk, confused, or attitude? What does this emoji mean? 18 for help desk, which is the right answer. I don't even know what that means, but help desk is the meaning of that. We have Zany Dingo in first place. On to the next one. Question, I believe, five. What does this emoji mean? Sad or crying, scared, disappointed but relieved, or angry? What does this emoji mean? The answer is disappointed but relieved. Question six, this is a personal poll. I have a hard time identifying my true feelings. I agree, I don't know, I disagree, I don't care. Go ahead and answer. 40% of us agree, 36 disagree, 11% don't care, 13% don't know. On to the next one, our last poll. I have a hard time controlling my emotions. True, false, leave me alone, I'm in a bad mood right now. Go ahead and put in your answer. 42, 42% say true, 37% say false, 6% in a bad mood right now, 15% says leave me alone. Well, I'm not going to because you're in church today, but I will try my best to make it not intolerable today. So that was fun, right? We got to see the meaning. Oh, I forgot about the leaderboard. Our winner is... Zany Dingo, give it up for Zany Dingo. Zany Dingo, where are you? Can you wave at me? Zany Dingo, I don't know. Oh, there he is. He was here first service. Don't clap for him. He was here first service. We don't clap for you. All right, that concludes our game. We got to see emojis that we probably use on a normal basis, and then we got to see the actual meaning of those emojis. Now, there are some, I think it was the help desk one, where people were like, what? <gasps> we all had opinions on what the emojis should mean, 
But the creator of the emoji had a specific intention when they created the emojis. We can all give our opinion on what an emoji should mean, but it honestly doesn't matter what we think because the creator gets to define the definition. I'm going to say that again. The creator gets to define what it means. As we're talking about our emotions, and today I want to talk a little bit on how we mislabel our emotions. I think the same way that we mislabeled what some of the emojis meant, I think that we can mislabel our emotions. And I think we can also mislabel the scriptures. I think it's very easy to say, here's what I think a scripture should say, but the reality is our opinion of what the Bible should say isn't as relevant as what God says in his word. One day I was sitting at home in my, at home in my office, and I was thinking about studying the Bible, and I was like, how can I know that I'm studying the Bible the right way? Is there a sentence or a question that I could come up with to properly know that I'm understanding the Bible? And here's what I got. The first question that I asked myself is, does God agree with my interpretation of his words? Does God agree with my interpretation of his words? Words, Because remember what we said about the emojis. The creator of the emojis had a purpose in creating them. And he had a definition when he created them. If I'm trying to put my own definitions on what God is saying, that's not as important as what is God actually trying to say. For example... If anybody went to a Bible class growing up, and especially one like the one I went to where we get a dollar for every Bible verse that we could say, what's the first verse that we would all yell? Jesus wept. <laughs> and we'd get our dollar for saying a Bible verse. Now, I could say all day, you know, I think the scripture means that Jesus looked up and he saw a sunset and a baby koala crawled up next to him. And because he saw how cute and cuddly this koala was, Jesus began to cry because he was moved emotionally. When the truth is, when the Bible says Jesus wept, I think what God's trying to communicate to us is that Jesus wept. I could try all day to put my own spin on what the scriptures mean, but it's very important for us to remember that God is trying to communicate something specific through his scriptures. And it's very easy for us to mislabel what God is speaking if we try to do things our own way. The second thing that I realized as I was thinking about this question of studying the scriptures and understanding God better, the second thing I got was this, that my theology has no effect on who God is. I'm going to say that again. My theology, my view of God has no effect on who God is. The goal when it comes to understanding God is not who do I think God is. It's getting in alignment with who does God know himself to be. If I was to ask everybody in this room, who is God, define God, we're going to have 500 different answers. The important thing is, am I aligning my answer with what God teaches us through his word? And I think when it comes to mislabeling, and looking at these definitions and having our own understanding that it can be a very dangerous game when we begin to take things out of context and begin to apply our own lenses onto the scripture. I think this is why God warned us in Proverbs chapter 3. It says this, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. I love that it says, lean not on your own understanding. Who here knows it's very easy to lean on your own understanding? I'm not saying this is anybody in this room, because not at our church. Does anybody here have a friend that is always right? They can never be wrong. They're right about everything. Who's sitting next to that friend? I don't know. Don't do that. Y'all going to get yourselves in trouble. Today, with this idea of having a proper understanding of what the Creator intended, I want us to discover some truths about ourselves, some truths about emotions and how they play a part in our walk with God. 
I want us to understand today what was God's intended purpose on giving us these emotions? Why did God give us emotions? Pastor Mike has been speaking about Jesus the last two weeks, and he's taught us that Jesus expresses 39 different emotions in the Bible. We saw that Jesus felt compassion and extended that to a widowed mother. We saw last week that Jesus had a moment where he was angry, where he was angry because people were taking something as important as worship and just using it as an opportunity to upsell people, to make as much money as they could during a time of worship. And today I want us to understand something, that emotions are not a burden given to us by God. Emotions are not a burden given to us by God. But yeah, I've seen so many bad emotions. You know what I think is the only thing worse than a bad emotion? People with no emotion at all. Have you ever talked to somebody with zero emotion? You're like, hey, how you doing? I am good. How are you? Uh, I'm good. What'd you eat for breakfast? I had six grams of peanut butter and four grams of oats. And I'm there like... When robots take over the earth, please don't forget about me. Please don't come back and kill me because you are so robotic. These emotions are the things that are part of making humans humans. And emotions have power, whether we use them in the right ways or the wrong ways. And this is something that we understand in our society today. We see the power of emotions and the power of feelings. We have had so much talk about our feelings and our emotions today that people are starting to confuse how they feel with who they are. Our identities are becoming rooted in how we feel. I think it's okay to say something like, I feel angry. But if somebody says, I am anger, that doesn't sound right to me. To define who you are based upon how you feel. If you feel hungry, it's one thing. If you are hunger, that is a big problem. Too much Chick-fil-A can do that to us. Here's the issue with confusing how you feel with who you are. If your identity is based on how you feel and your feelings change from day to day, you have no foundation for your life. I'm going to say that again. If who you are is defined by how you feel, and how you feel changes sometimes minute to minute, you have no foundation for your life. Upstairs in teens a few weeks ago, I was sharing about this. I was talking about how in elementary school, all we talked about was bullying, bullying, bullying. We had seminars on bullying. We had assemblies on bullying. We watched videos on bullying. We had teachings on bullying. Why? There was a bullying crisis when I was in school. Today, what's the dominant voice? Identity, 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 identity. What groups do you identify with? What political party do you identify with? As an individual, how do you identify yourself? Why are we talking so much about identity? Ladies and gentlemen, we are living in the middle of an identity crisis. The reason we talk so much about identity is whether people know it or not, we are in the middle of an identity crisis. And I think working with the students, I see this so much, that students are looking for a sense of identity. Some will find their identity in their music and who they hang out with and the things that they do. In our society, many of us are finding our identity in the things that change from day to day. There was a group when I was in my friend group in high school that I should be a 60-year-old man. They're like, Josh, you are an old man. You need to identify as an old man. They'd call me at 8 o'clock to go bowling or go eat. You know what I would do? I'd have to take the covers off my head and be like, what do you guys want? They're like, it's 8 o'clock. You're 20. You acting like you're 70. Stop playing chess. Yes, I love to play chess. I am at heart probably an old man. Can I identify as an old man? Can I find my identity in being an old man? No. And if you're 60, I'm not calling you old, Dad. I'm sorry. I'm not (laughs) calling you an old man today. I'm just making the point today that I want us to know that in the church that we have a place that we can find our identity. 
We have our identity rooted in somebody named Jesus Christ. And I think what's so powerful is not only that we found our identity in Christ, but that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Thousands of years ago, God gave us an identity that would not change. And we see the effects today in society of changing identities. Now, have we done the best as a church at knowing who we are in Christ? No. We can always do better. But I'm glad that God has given us a solution to this problem of identity. In the scriptures, we're, we're instructed to put off the old self, to put away the old self, and to put on the new and true self. Paul shows us this in Ephesians chapter 4. He says this, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self. Everybody say, put off off. your old self. self. It then says, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. To be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self. Everybody say, put on on. the new self. self. It then says that that new self is created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Take off the old and put on the new. Take off the old and put on the new. When you look at the original text, it's literally talking about the idea of changing your clothes. You're taking off the old and you're putting on the new. Imagine that you lived your whole life with the same wardrobe and it was torn up and it was dirty, and there was no hope for this wardrobe. Like, it was bad. It was all stained. And then somebody comes to you and gives you a brand new wardrobe. But all you do is you let it sit in the closet. You never put on the new clothes. You never take off the old clothes. You don't see the effect of having this new wardrobe. But the moment that you take off the old and you put on the new, not only is it going to change the way that you see yourself, It's going to change the way that others view you. When you take off the old and you put on the new and others see Christ in you, they're going to have some questions. They're going to be like, why didn't you just curse that lady out? That's not the girl I know. What, What was that about? Why are you so kind? Why are you so friendly? When you put off the old and put on the new, there is something that changes in your life. Paul's instructing us in terms of your former way of life. Take off the old, put on the new. Yes, we have a role to play in taking off the old and putting on the new. And let's tie this into emotions now. Maybe the old you, you've always screamed at people on the highway. Somebody cuts you off and you just blow up. Well, this is just who I am. This is my true self. This is who God created me to be. Wrong. We are not created to scream at people on the highway. Take off the old and put on the peace of God. Maybe say, I've just always been an emotional train wreck. God has just created me to be an emotional train wreck. No, he hasn't. Put off the old and take up the new. Maybe you say, I've always been a sickly person. I've always just gotten sick. It's who God wants me to be. No, no. Put off the old and take up the healing that God has won for you. Last one, maybe you say things like, I've just always been a control freak. I always have a control problem. I want to encourage you to take off the old and put on the new. The things that we used to struggle with, the struggles of our past are not excuses to hurt the people around us. You can't hurt someone and say, well, you don't understand the way that I was raised. You don't understand the things that I've been through. If I'm being honest, the things that you've been through aren't your fault. The things that happened to you as a child are not your fault, but they are your responsibility. They are the things that we can use to either destroy us or be a testimony of God's power in our life. Take off the old and pick up the new. I believe the real reason why people are confused, confusing the idea of who I am with how I feel is that at our core, we don't know who we are. We don't understand who we've been created to be. And a wrong perception of ourselves is going to give us a wrong perception of the world around us. 
The truth is too many of us go to the grave without ever knowing who we truly are. Too many of us go to the grave not understanding who we've been created to be. I'm going to butcher this because I don't know the exact quote, but it's something along the lines of, you want to find potential? Look at a graveyard. Graveyards are full of untapped potential, of people who died not accomplishing what they're created to do because they never knew who they were created to be. I want to ask you today, is your identity found in your emotions or is your identity found in God? Is your identity found in your emotions or is your identity found in God? Are you your emotions? If I could speak Spanish, I'd do it, but I ain't even going to try. I ain't even going to try. Are you the sum of the things that you feel? Are you your feelings? There's probably two camps in the church world. There's probably two ideas, and it probably makes sense to be in the middle of both. There's the one side that says you can't trust your emotions. Do not trust your emotions. Your emotions are the devil. You go into church, you're happy. I'm feeling great. Good morning. That's the devil, sweetie. He wants you to be happy so that he can steal your purse. Don't be happy. You're grieving a loss. You lost a family member. Oh, God doesn't want you to grieve. You need to take control of your emotions. Don't be sad. I want to tell you something today. That the Bible does not say never grieve. That's right. The Bible doesn't say never have emotions. Emotions are a gift from God. And then there's the other camp that says every emotion that you feel is from God. Every single emotion that you feel is from God. I'm feeling mad about somebody. I, oh, oh, sorry about that. I ordered a quadruple cheeseburger. I only got three patties on it. Now I'm mad. Oh, that's from, that's from the Lord. You just have to find out what the Lord's saying. I feel hungry. Oh, the Lord wants you to feast on his word. That's what he's saying to you. No, you skip breakfast. Not every single thing that you feel is from God. I think both sides are missing the point. Let's stay in the middle. First of all, if a feeling or an emotion is a direct violation of God's word, it is not from God. For instance, if somebody said to me, I feel like the Holy Spirit is accusing me. I feel like the Holy Spirit is accusing me. Now I'm going to say to you, Satan is the accuser of the brethren. The Bible says in John chapter 14, verse 26, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you. The Holy Spirit is a comforter. If there's a feeling or a voice that is against Christ, that is the opposite of God, then that feeling is not the voice of God. On the other hand, I do believe that God uses our emotions and our feelings in order to communicate with us. I truly believe that emotions are a gift from God. I believe that peace is a feeling. Peace is a feeling. Joy is a feeling. The Bible says that we can encounter the peace of God that surpasses understanding. Peace when it doesn't even make sense. I believe that that is God communicating to us through his emotions. I want us to realize today and change the way that we think about ourselves and change the way that we think about our emotions. Like God is a pretty good designer. If you look at the universe, it's designed pretty well. It is amazing the things that God has done. If you look at the human body, it is amazing. Just look at a graph of the human body. It is insane what God has done. He's designed us very intricately and very attentionally. We are not an accident. Our emotions are not an accident. And you might say, but yeah, Pastor Josh, there's good emotions like joy. There's good emotions like being happy. And then there's bad emotions like being angry. Angry is a bad emotion. Well, if you're here last week and heard Pastor Mike talk about anger, he gives the answer. But I want to expand on it just a little bit to show us that emotions don't have to be good or bad, that emotions could be something that are useful. Here's what happens when you get angry. 
Your body muscles, they tense up. Your heart rate increases. Your breathing rate increases. Your blood pressure goes up. Your attention narrows when you get super angry. Who here has ever been angry and you're not thinking about what's for dinner? You're not thinking about if you need to put gas in the car. You are hyper-focused on the person or the thing in front of you. And on top of all of that, your body releases adrenaline, and it gives you an energy boost. You can say, all those things make up anger, and that's bad, right? No, because parents, especially with young kids, if you're at the park and a random person offers your kid candy and is waving them over to their car, what do you want to happen? You want your body muscles to tense up. You want your heart rate to increase to get you oxygen. You want your breathing rate to increase to get you oxygen. You want to be hyper-focused on your kid, and you want the adrenaline so that you can beat somebody up. (laughs) When you're angry, what are you ready to do? You're ready to fight. It's your body's way of being ready to fight. Is it always bad to fight? No. If someone's trying to grab your kid, you want to fight. If somebody messes up your order, come on now. (laughs) Is it worth fighting over a messed up order? We can say that anger is only a bad thing, but I believe that that is the same thing as mislabeling what the creator intended. Used in the right way, anger can prepare us to defend ourselves, to defend our families, to defend those that we care about. The issue is not that we're angry and we're ready for battle. The issue is when we're ready to destroy the things that God has called us to protect. The issue is when we're ready to fight the people that God has called us to lead. When we're angry at our children, what's our body ready to do? Physiologically, we're ready to fight. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think you should fight a three-year-old. We need to understand our emotions. Let's not mislabel them. Let's use them how God has intended them to. Now, on a big picture scale, well, all right, Pastor Josh, I see that emotions could be good, but how do I know when to use the emotions and when to control them? I believe that 1 John chapter 4 gives us this answer in verse 1. It says this, Dear friends, Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether or not they're from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. So how do you test spirits? You put them next to the person of Jesus Christ. You put them next to the word of God, and you say, is this something that is for God, or is this something that is against God? Now, I want us to take our emotions and do the same thing. When we feel an emotion, is it something that God would want me to be feeling right now? Or is it not something that God would want me to be feeling right now? Anger towards the people that I love, that I care about? Probably not. Anger towards people that are trying to attack those that I love? Probably. We take those emotions that we feel and we put them next to the person of Christ. We put the thoughts that we have next to the person of Christ. And if it doesn't line up with God's word, we push it away. If it does line up with God's word, we embrace it. Ask yourselves, do my emotions and my thoughts and my feelings line up with God? We have to test these things. We have to make sure that we're embracing the right things and pushing away the wrong things. And if you've done it wrong your whole life, Today is the perfect day to start. Maybe you're around people that are feeling emotional right now. You're with somebody that's mourning. You don't have to smile in their face and try to cheer them up. It's okay to mourn with people who are mourning. It's okay to rejoice with people who are rejoicing. If you're encountering thoughts and feelings that aren't from God, now what do I do? 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We demolish arguments in every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought, say every thought, thought. 
to make it obedient to Christ. And we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. Those things that come against you, those thoughts and emotions that are clearly against you, I want to encourage you to take those thoughts captive and make them obedient to Jesus Christ. If we take these ideas and we put it all together, this idea of understanding yourself, understanding your emotions, understanding your identity, the significance of knowing who God created us to be, what, what, what do we get at here? Here's my main idea. When we understand who we are, it impacts our view of who God is. When we understand who we are, it impacts our view of who God is is. What do I mean? If we believe that we are worthless, if we believe that we have no value, guess what we're not going to do? We're not going to approach God. If we're in a moment where we feel like we can't go to God because we are so bad, our view of ourselves is now impacting our walk with God. But at the same time, when we understand who we are in Christ, and we understand who God has created us to be. Even in the moments when we mess up, we know we can still go to our Heavenly Father because His grace is with us and His mercies are new every single day. The same way that as we understand ourselves and who God created us to be, it changes us for the right reasons. I believe that the enemy will try to use it to do the exact opposite. That the enemy will try to deceive us and lie to us about who we are. And we see this with Jesus in Matthew chapter 3. Watch, watch this. In Matthew chapter 3, it says that as soon as Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. A voice from heaven said, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. So Jesus is baptized, and what does he hear from his father? He hears his identity. His identity is, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Watch what happens in the very next chapter. It says that Jesus was led by the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, watch this, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. The father announces Jesus as the son. And what does Satan do in the next chapter? Attacks his identity. If you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus is 40 days with no food. I'm sure he's very hungry. I'm going to guess that he was emotional, not eating for 40 days. I've seen people without food for four hours, and Lord, they could get emotional. And all this stuff, Satan attacks his identity. If you are who God says you are, you would do what I say. Satan knows he has no power or authority over Jesus, so he tries to get him to lay his identity down. I wonder how many times when we get into a rough spot that we lay our identities down. Those times when we're emotionally drained, where we lay our identities down. Watch what Jesus says as an answer. And this is an answer that we all have the power to use. Jesus says, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. He quotes scriptures. The devil took him up to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point. Watch. If you are the son of God, that's twice now, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. He's trying to challenge Jesus' identity. By using the scriptures. And what's Jesus do? He quotes the scriptures to help Satan understand, listen, buddy. <laughs> Don't try to tell me about the book that I wrote, all right? <laughs> like, give me a break. 
He's, he's firm in his knowledge of the scriptures. Watch this. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world. He said, I will give you all of this if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. It then says, then the devil left him. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended to him. Jesus uses this power that he has. He uses the word of God. He speaks the word of God when somebody tries to challenge him. I want you to know today that you have the same power on the inside of you. You have the same ability to speak the word of God when situations try to exalt themselves against yourself and try to exalt themselves against Christ. What Satan's doing here is he's trying to make Jesus doubt. He's attacking him through this thing named doubt. When I look up the word doubt, you see that it's spelled D-O-U-B-T. If you switch the O and the U, you get the word, the word duo. Why? The word doubt is actually suggesting that somebody has two minds. The word doubt has the idea that you have two minds at work. And I want you to know today that there's going to be times where you might start to doubt. I'm not telling you to never doubt, but here's what I am saying. I'm telling you to go with the voice of God. When there's two minds at work, when there's the voice of the enemy and the voice of God, I want you to go with the voice of God. When there's negative thoughts about yourself and then there's what God says about you, I want you to choose to believe what God says about you. Now, how do we do these things? We have to learn. Would Jesus be able to quote scriptures if he didn't know them? No. I promise you, whatever situation you might find yourself in, that there is a scripture that you can apply. A great way to learn scriptures that apply to your circumstance is to go on Google and type in scriptures about healing, yes. scriptures about faith. Whatever thing you need, go ahead, look it up, and quote those every single day as you're going through those situations. When we get these definitions right, when we challenge those things that come against us and we quote the word of God, that is when we begin to live a victorious life. When we hold on to the words that God speaks and we push away the wrong ideas, we walk in victory. And maybe you're here today and you feel like, yeah, that's, a, that's nice in theory, but you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know what my past looks like. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. It doesn't say, therefore, if anyone who prays five times a day. It doesn't say, therefore, if anyone who says sorry when they mess up. It doesn't say, therefore, if anyone who lives a perfect life. It says, therefore, if anyone who is in Christ, you are a new creation. I want you to understand today that those things that have always held you back, they don't have to hold you, always hold you back. Yeah. Those things that you've mislabeled, that you've misunderstood, I want you to know that today is the perfect day to start things new. If you are in Christ, you are a new creation creation. Let's pray today. Father, we come to you today in Jesus' name. And Lord, we thank you for your word that will never return void. Father, I pray today if there's anybody in this room that's struggling with their identity, that is struggling with who they are in you, that is struggling with mislabeling their emotions or their life, God, I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you would lead them and guide them unto all truths. Lord, I thank you today that we are new creations in Christ Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that we would remind ourselves of that in those moments when life gets difficult. I thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And today I want us to pray a second prayer. This is known as the prayer of salvation. If you've never made a decision to follow Jesus for your life personally, we all pray this together. It goes like this. It goes, dear God, come to you today just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior, 
Jesus, I believe that you died and rose for me. Come into my heart. Come into my life to change me and make me new. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, did anybody pray that prayer for the very first time today? Can you wave at me so we can celebrate you? Is there anybody that prayed that for the first time? All right, I see a few over here. Can we give it up? We celebrate you guys today. We have a book that we'd love to share with you at our Welcome Center if you want to check in as you guys are on the way out. Let's go ahead and pray for our week, and then you guys will be dismissed. Father, we come to you today in Jesus' name, and Lord, we thank you for your word. I pray, Lord, that as we're going throughout this week, God, that you give us the strength to shovel all the snow, that our bodies are protected, and that we are joyous throughout these times. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks for watching today's message. My name is Pastor John Mark, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. We want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm going to ask you to do is to take your next step in your journey. We'd love to help you do that, and you can head over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started 